Greetings and salutations. It is I, Mr. Nothing, the museum curator of the weird and the strange and the host who might be a robot. Welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out of the ordinary literature that I have found uh, in my travels into the future. Uh, welcome, um, welcome back to Short Story Tuesday. Um, said that weird, but uh, it's a day for me to talk about all the um, the unusual short stories out there, all the short stories that I that I that I read that I enjoy. Um, short form literature is pretty cool in that way. Today, I want to talk about a short story uh, from a classic science fiction author uh, that is about robots uh, and the difference between being a robot and being a human. Uh, I am talking about Bicentennial Man by Isaac Asimov. For those that don't know Isaac Asimov, and like, why wouldn't you know who he is? He's a he's a big name in uh, science fiction, speculative fiction, uh, who wrote countless works of short stories, of, of books, of of series, of of letters, um, various stuff like that, uh, all about robots and the future and. You know, robots in the future and the the laws of robotics uh, which like he created and a lot of people have based their science fiction around uh, so yeah he's he's a pretty prolific author um, I want I've wanted to check him out for a while um, but never <laughs> haven't gotten around to it it's sort of been like a running joke here where I, I say oh I'm gonna check out Isaac Asimov this month and then I completely forget or don't do that at all. Uh, and so I, I did want to check him out and um, and see what he had to offer because I haven't read Isaac Asimov before. I've he, He's so in, enmeshed in pop culture that it's hard not to know about Isaac Asimov or what he's written about. Um, but I figured since, you know, I, I've checked out Philip K. Dick and Harlan Ellison, I should probably also check out Asimov because I, fi I feel like they're in the same vein of... Uh, of their their work like they're both talking about the future and and uh how science can go awry and um the possibilities and also the dangers uh so yeah i i was re uh, really interested in reading him uh he again he wrote a lot of things something that i was shocked to find out though is much like harlan ellison uh he was accused by uh his female colleagues of um you know uh, predatory behavior, uh, leering and groping and, and making women uncomfortable when he was around them. And uh, a lot of uh, women have said that he's, he made uh, 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 the uh, the world of science fiction, the ri science fiction writing landscape hostile towards women, uh, along with Harlan Ellison, uh, which I, I don't disagree with. Um, I uh, I, I get the sense that uh, a lot of the reason why the early science fiction writers were men was because they were doing everything in their power to keep women out, or at least um, being so gross and predatory in their behavior as to make women avoid the field altogether. Uh, luckily, that's changed recently, but uh, you, you still have racism and misogyny existing there. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so uh, that that's unfortunate that that's um, an aspect of his life, uh, but um, hopefully we, we can talk about it rather than trying to avoid it and we can make science fiction better in the future. Uh, and so without further ado, let's talk about Bicentennial Man. Uh, I'll do some summary, some analysis, and we will move on from there. Bicentennial Man takes place in the future. It focuses on a robot named Andrew, one of the, the first robots uh, and uh, sort of with a primitive brain system. It has a positronic brain system like the other robots, uh, but his is, is uh, has developed to a point where it's unique and um, he's not... Uh, He's not like other not like other robots. He's he's he has some human side to him, such as the fact that he's creating art um, and 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 do, uh, making beautiful beautiful works of art. Uh, he lives with the Martin family. He's their he's their robot servant. Every a lot of people have robot servants at this time. Um, and Andrew uh, is making works of art in the Martin family. He takes that art and sells it. And because they love Andrew um, and they're they're probably a good family, they uh, they agree to let him keep the money. Uh, at first, he has to he has to uh, the Martin family has to work with a lawyer to make sure that 
he can, that's a that's a thing they can do, um, and there doesn't seem to be a problem with it. Later, and uh, Andrew tries to use that money to uh, to buy his freedom from the Martin family. He'll stay with them, but he still wants the label of free. Uh, so. Uh, and Andrew goes takes this to the courts where they establish that yes he is he is free um, he is free will and whatnot so he uh, is a free robot now and that makes him happy for a time being. Uh, eventually he comes upon a um, uh, he go he's going to the library and he comes upon two strangers who see him wearing human clothing and they're like we don't like that robots are are pretty terrible he's the free robot so we can just steal him uh, and they try to use the laws of robotics against him uh, but one of the the Martin family comes up and uh, uh, um, manages to scare them off um, he takes this uh, this thing before like the world government and and uh, tries to get them to pass laws that are a uh, anti-robot violence so basically making sure that that robots are on some equal footing with humans and, and not being and that violence against them isn't isn't legal uh, some laws do get passed but people note that the laws might might not be enough and the punishments aren't aren't enough uh, to discourage vi uh, violence or various crimes against robots uh, eventually, the Martin family pressures uh, the U.S. robotics company to give um, Andrew a new a new body. They say that because he's a robot, he's entitled to an upgrade, and because he's a um, a free human, like he should be able to pay for this on his own. And the U.S. robotics company eventually agrees to it, but they they decide to change their uh, their laws and their their policies so that uh, robots like Andrew don't develop in the future, because to them he's considered um, an outlier, a danger something like to be avoided because they don't want robots getting free will or anything like that um yeah uh, so eventually the last of the martin family dies and and uh andrew is on his own he does a bunch of research into robot biology uh trying to figure out um how to how to further become human and, and gain the rights of a human. Um, he ends up uh, changing a lot of his inner biology, uh, his inner workings, uh, seeing a bunch of specialists to get that done uh, and getting closer to closer to not really being um, not really being much of a robot anymore, uh, but he still manages to uh, keep keep his uh, positronic brain that allows him to be creative and helps him live a longer life. In terms of analysis, there's a uh, there's a big question at the heart of this story. Um, uh, two two kind of questions. The first is, what does it mean to be a robot? And related, what does it mean to be a human? Uh, in in terms of being a human or being a robot, sorry, uh, it seems like the society as a whole agreed that if you were made in a robotic factory, you are a robot. And it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like no matter how much. Andrew tries to replace his body. Um, the 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 status of being a human is always, or the status of being a robot is is always steady and st static for him. Like he's not going to suddenly become a human unless something drastic changes. So it's really easy to be labeled a robot to the point where it seems like if you if you have any prosthetics, you might be labeled a robot. That's an um, issue that comes up later in the story that isn't fully explained. Um, but it, it would be worth ex exploring in a, uh, a further um, a further story. And then the question, what does it mean to be a human? Well, it, there's a lot, actually. Because um, uh, uh, Andrew sues to get his freedom, he, which doesn't fully make him human yet. Uh, he he gets he gets access to money, so he has a lot of legal rights there. Um, but of course, that doesn't make him human either. He changes a lot of his biology, uh, but because he still has that positronic um, uh, brain thing in his head, uh, you know that doesn't make him fully human either. Um, and it gets to the point where the only way he's going to be legally classified as a human is if he is if he appeals to the World Council. And he actually does try to do that. Uh, but um, the the council has their their you know ifs and ifs ands or buts about it like they're they're very hesitant to do that and I, and Andrew figures out the reason um, in in, a, in an interesting passage that I'll read to you. My own positronic pathways have nearly have lasted nearly two centuries without perceptible change and can last for centuries more. Isn't that the fundamental barrier? Human beings can tolerate an immortal robot, for it doesn't matter how long a machine lasts. But they cannot tolerate an immortal human being since their own mor mortality is endurable only so long as it's universal. And for that reason, they won't make me a human being. 
And so what I think Andrew is getting at there is that the reason he can't be classified as a human is because if he were to be a human, like, it'd probably make the other humans feel inferior, for one, but it, it doesn't fit with the, the, con the human concept of, of what it means to be a human because they die. Like, they have, they have human brains and they die. And, uh, he, uh, like, Andrew can um, get, change his brain to a, a more human brain, but uh, that's not going to be enough to, to, to take him, to kill him. Or that's not going to be enough to uh, make him human. He's got to die like the other humans die in order to be considered a human being. Uh, getting rid of essentially the last aspect of his robotic nature. Uh, so I think that's interesting. Um, Asimov raises a lot of questions about you know the nature of human existence and the nature of what it means to be a robot. Uh, and uh, personally, I think the lot the thing that should have been the the cinch for uh, Andrew to become a human is his brain. He doesn't need to die. He he just needs to replace all the aspects uh, that that make him a robot. Living forever doesn't make you a robot. Tons of creatures can live extremely long lives. Turtles, for instance. <laughs> uh, but I guess that doesn't really um, help Andrew's case there. So it's just it's just an interesting idea, and I like that Asimov poses that question. Another interesting thing about this short story is how it raises a, a ship of thesis dilemma where Andrew slowly replaces parts of his body uh, until he's no it seems like he's no longer Andrew and that's the ship of thesis right there where the the, the paradox is that uh, the sh as the ship breaks down you replace more parts of it but eventually you get to a point where you replace so many parts that it's no longer the original ship it's a completely new ship uh, so can you still call it you know the ship of thesis anymore you have to call it something else and so um, by the by the end of the story Andrew has replaced so many parts of himself. Can you say he's a robot anymore? Can you say that he's Andrew anymore? Uh, I would say until you replace the brain, you're still the person you are. And that's a big question in, in philosophy is what makes a human being their self? Like, what is the essence of you? It might be your soul. It might be your brain. Uh, uh, philosophers haven't fully figured out the answer to that question yet. Uh, but it's it's in it's interesting to see that here uh, and how uh, um, Asimov is, is remarking on it. Another interesting aspect of this story is, is like, who gets rights? Uh, uh, Andrew has to sue to be to one like be seen as free, uh, but also he has to sue to uh, or strike up a legal battle to be able to uh, afford some things in the world to be able to. Uh, um, have a bank account and have access to money. Uh, these are special cases for Andrew, and they even they, they uh, the society shifts around him so that other robots do not get these privileges in the future. So it raises a bunch of questions like who gets rights in the future? Will robots even be able to get rights? Uh, will they will they have to fight for those rights like many other people have fought before? Uh, and it makes you think about the present moment we're living in because we're, uh, not every not every human has the same rights. You know, some people don't have equal equal access to voting or health healthcare or you know food safety or or anything like that we're still fighting for many equal rights uh in america and throughout the world uh so if, if we humans haven't been able to figure that out uh, i i think it's fitting that like we're still we're still going to be struggling with with robots when they become a a bigger feature in the future uh so another interesting thing that asimov brings up there uh the only thing i didn't like about this story was uh uh, the the heavy legal talk, um, and I guess that that's fitting because it was it, it's trying to decide uh, you know philosophical questions and also the legal question of of is uh, Andrew a human? So it needs to be there, but it did it did kind of bog down the story a little bit and make it a bit boring. Um, uh, but that that couldn't really be avoided, and it it didn't it didn't uh, completely destroy the story. So um, which and I which I I enjoyed because it's a it's such an interesting um, and and wonderful story uh that i that i uh that i enjoyed because it's interesting to see how andrew fights for what he wants and how he's so completely different that the humans don't know what to make out of him and ultimately i would say i yeah i enjoyed this story i recommend it that you go find it out there um i read it in a asimov collection so there's probably a bunch of asimov collections that, that contain that specific uh short story and it's worth reading um i can't wait to read more asimov stories in the future uh just to get a feel for what else he's saying about you know the future and robots and and current society. 
Um, if you have read this book before uh, and you want to comment on something I said or you want to comment on my review in general, be sure to do that. I would love to hear from you and have a conversation about Isaac Asimov and robots and robot rights. Um, otherwise, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so that we can uh, start a conversation about robot rights on YouTube. Uh, don't forget to follow me on Twitter so that we can talk about robots and robots rights on Twitter. Uh, and in the meantime, I wish you the best of luck in your weird and futurist travels. Farewell.